Let's pray together as we go to Scripture. Gracious Father, we have gathered here to worship you this day. And as we do so, Father, we open our hearts and our lives to you. We come to your sacred word, Father. We come to read it. We pray, Father, that uh, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, that we'll understand it. And then, Father, that we will apply it to our lives, that we will be drawn into a closer relationship with you. Father, we love you so much for your goodness and grace which you bestow upon us. We have come to worship, and as we do so, Father, guide us and lead us into a, a deeper belief and a deeper trust with you today. We ask in Christ's precious name, amen. It seems almost a little taken for granted that we would title a message, When Will You Believe and Trust, to a group of Christians that come to church week by week. And for some of you who've been worshiping here for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 40 years, you know you have a belief system already in our Lord Jesus Christ, and you trust him already. Well, I'd like to go to John chapter 6, because we find there a couple of stories and signs in John chapter 6. And as we, as we peel back the layers and nuance these stories, I believe at the core, we'll be looking at the issues of belief and trust. So let me ask you, that you would spend some time today as we worship. And just as we go through these stories, picture yourself in these stories. And what I would ask you to reflect upon is where you would be in these stories. Would you be observing from the sidelines? Would Jesus be talking directly to you? Would another person be talking to you? Would you be saying, Oh, I know all of this already. There's really not much I can learn today. Interesting thought, isn't that troublesome in even thinking that way? So, when will we believe and when will we trust? Let that question linger in your mind and let it just marinate there for a bit as we go to John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, verses one, uh, 1 through 10, we find there the setting of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And it's really a cue up and a lead in uh, to the scene on the sea. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, a large group followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Verse 3, when Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat down with the disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing the large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. The setting is so very clear and easy to understand, but I believe that these ins instances will teach us at least seven spiritual lessons. This he was saying to test him, for he knew himself what he was intending to do. Philip answered him and said, 200 worth, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad which has five loaves uh, and two fish, but what are these among so many? So just to set the context, 
to get uh, to make sure that we're all sort of on the same page. Now, when they were numbering in those days, they <clears throat> they only counted men. So it was about 5,000 men. Add in about 5,000 women. And let's put in another 10,000 children. We're talking of a crowd of about 20,000 people. And they had heard Jesus teaching and preaching all day long. And as the day grew long, longer than anyone anticipated, the sun was starting to set and the disciples were getting nervous. We can't send these folks home without any food. I wondered why they thought that from the beginning. Is missing one meal really going to matter? 20,000 people. And I'm scratching my head. I kind of like the logistics of thinking about feeding 20,000 people. I like it when we go to the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And they have a food line there. Usually have about eight lines. And they feed 40,000 people in about an hour and a half. They go through those lines just like ants. And everything's taken care of. And they're back in the meeting in about two hours. Think with me, however... There is no food. No food to be found. It's not a matter of that you could call ahead and uh, send me 20 food trucks and let, a, let them be there because we know Jesus is coming and we're going to need 20,000 meals. Uh-uh. It was bring your own food for that meal. And if you didn't bring food for the meal, there wasn't any to be found. Now, just logistically, if let's just say... It was $7 a head to feed these folks in today's dollars. That would be about 100 and... Who's good mathematician? 7 times 20,000 would be what? $140,000 worth of food. 1-800? I'd like to order it express. I know at short notice. Please, can you have it here in an hour? It'll be, it be 150000 because of short notice. Next to impossible, isn't it? Now, where are you in this story? Do you believe that these folks are going to be fed? Hmm, you've already read the story. You know how the story ends. Let's follow along. So Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient. For everyone to receive a little, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here that has five barley loaves and two fishes. But what are these among so many people? The first spiritual lesson I believe we can learn from this story and the miracles that are about to happen is never assess a difficulty in light of your own resources. Simply put, this means never look at a problem and then try to work it out depending upon your own reserves. When we look and view at the difficulties that come into our lives, there are insurmountable situations and circumstances that we find ourselves into. And our belief system says, this is so huge, I can't do it on my own. And it's true, isn't it? Do you find yourself in those situations from time to time? But the first spiritual lesson of this is never assess a difficulty in the light of your own resources, but in the resources of our Lord Jesus Christ to come and provide for your needs. The second thing that I believe that this story tells us is let's look what happens. Verse 9, there is a lad who has five loaves and ten fish. But what are these among so many people? And Jesus said, have them sit down. Now there is much grass in the place, so the men sat down, and about 5,000 in number. And he took the loaves, and he had given thanks, and he distributed those to those who were seated. Likewise, also the fish, as they wanted. And the Bible says they were all what? They were all filled. It's amazing and incredible. We don't have all of the details of this story. Perhaps Jesus 
Perhaps Jesus gathered the disciples. They were seated about 500 in a group, uh, the people in the assembly. Perhaps he just placed in their hands a broken piece, a piece of a small fish broken among his disciples. Just a broken piece. Now the five barley loaves were not loaves of bread as we think of them. Probably five biscuits, maybe about this big. Part of a fish and part of a biscuit in their hands. And they were to go forth and feed 500 people each from what was in their hands. He offered thanks to his heavenly Father. They moved out and went through one group after the other. They held their hand out like this to one individual to take the bread and the other to take the fish. And we don't know exactly how it happened, but they didn't run out. The morsel of fish was gone, and suddenly there appeared two whole fish. Suddenly the morsel of bread. There was two morsels of bread in this hand. When those were gone, there were three or four, and three or four more, until they moved around 500 people in each of the groups, and everybody ate until they were full. I like that story, don't you? Wouldn't it be great to travel back in the stream of time and to be there? And now, your person 249 in that group of 500, you see the disciple walking around, and you're, you're, you're smiling, and you're just hoping, let's keep this up. He's on 200. I'm about 249. I hope he makes it to 260 because I'm hungry. Now, you wouldn't really think that way, would you? I would. I would. If blessings are coming around, I want to be there. I believe God can do it. How about you, friends? Where's your belief system? What does it tell you? Can he do it? Well, he does. So much so that everybody ate as much as they wanted. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing might be lost. And they had 12 baskets full, which was left over in five barley loaves. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which, they, which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is come into the world. So, the second thing that we learn from this story is that which is transferred, the young boy brought it to the disciples, his food, his lunch, so small and so meager. That which is transferred to Jesus is transformed. That which is transferred to Jesus is transformed. Our so little, our so little, which seems so a lot in our hands. When we bring it to Jesus and say, Jesus, this is all that I have here. I want to worship you and give it to you. He transforms it and it goes forward, not added to, but multiplied. Do you like the power of Jesus? He multiplies it, but he doesn't do it just for our own good. He does it to bless the multitude. That which is transferred is transformed. So let me ask you, friends, how is your belief system today? Is it deep enough? Is it strong enough to say, I have seen how God has worked, and I believe that I'm going to trust in Him to transform that which I give to Him that others might be blessed? The second lesson is that which we have transferred to Jesus, he multiplies. It's a solid biblical fact that is a simple fact that little is much if God is in it. 
Little is much when it's given to God and it's multiplied and it's distributed to the multitude. God always has an abundance to meet the greatest need that we face. So in the queue up and in the context of John chapter 6, this is the opening of the lessons in John chapter 6. But the story doesn't stop there. Now we find the disciples. All have eaten. Twelve baskets of food left. Five barley loaves left. Plenty left over. Pack it away. Send it home with the crowd. And Jesus said, Go. Go cross the lake. I will meet you on the other side. I'm going to go be by myself in prayer. The disciples leave. It's around sundown. They get in that boat and they start rowing across that lake. It's a large lake, commonly called a sea. And as they're rowing across the sea, the winds come up over the mountains. The waves come up. And they're in dire straits. The boat, little boat is being rocked back and forth. And they can see the waves. And they've been rowing for a couple of hours. Their muscles are tired. These are seasoned fishermen. And the Bible says that they were afraid. Fear came into their hearts and into their lives. Now when a fisherman is afraid of rowing in a boat, that's the time to be scared. I mean, they can read the ways. They can read the weather. They know what's going on. They're a few miles from their destination. But it looks hopeless. It looks hopeless. They think they're about to perish, as you heard in the Scripture reading today. And in the midst of the storm, they remember. And they see off in the distance, off in the distance, a bright figure coming towards them. They can't quite figure out in the midst of the rain and in the waves. And they wonder, what's going on? And as Jesus approaches, as Jesus approaches, in the midst of that storm which is about to take their lives, let me ask you, off in the distance, where is their belief? How much belief do they have? It's up to us. We better row harder. We better work harder. And off in the distance, as Jesus comes closer and closer, one, one can see it's Jesus. Peter, I love Peter. Impetuous Peter. I love him so much. Lord, is that you? Yes, it is. Come on to me. Peter gets up on the side of that boat, and without hesitation, he starts walking towards Jesus. His belief system was like this. Boom, I'm ready to go. And he's off and walking to Jesus. The Bible doesn't tell us how far he got. But the Bible tells us as long as he kept his eyes focused on Jesus and walking towards Jesus, he was fine. Somewhere along the way, he realized, now wait a minute, where's the boat and where am I? What did I get myself into? I believe that's Jesus. He's walking on water, but where am I? I don't walk on water. I'm, the boat must be, the place of safety is behind me. And he turns to look back for just a moment. And he starts to sink. Where is his belief system then? One minute, looking straight in the eyes of Jesus, focused on Jesus, progressing towards Jesus, and the next moment, very impetuously looking back, well, if I get in trouble here, I want to make sure I'm only a step or two from that boat, that I can reach it, because at least if Jesus leaves, I can drag myself back into the boat. And down he goes. And Jesus just gently reaches out and pulls him right out of the water. Now where are you in this story? Are you still in the boat when Jesus is coming near the security of the unknown?
Are you out walking on the water? Are you watching Peter saying, well, maybe I'm next to go to Jesus? But I don't know after Peter goes down. How is it in your belief system when Jesus calls you out of the boat into that place of uncomfortable zone, into that place of the unknown, when the Holy Spirit says, wait a minute, that neighbor of yours just 25 feet from your house needs a word of encouragement. Tell them about the good news of the gospel. Let them know how Jesus is working in your life. Step out of the boat into the midst of the water, in the midst of the storm of life, as storms will come. The fifth lesson is simply to look to Jesus. Do you believe that, friends? That belief, that belief system, when we believe, we must trust. And when we trust, we must look to Jesus. Jesus. And He will reach down from heaven to take our hand and strengthen our belief. In the midst of the storms of life, remember to look to Jesus. But John chapter 6 doesn't end there. John chapter 6, at the end of John chapter 6, it, 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 we're going to go to uh, the next segment here, but I must reflect on one piece before we do. Peter said on him, uh, Jesus said unto Peter, it is I, do not be afraid, and called Peter forth. And as... Um, as he rescued Peter, Jesus brought them safely to the shore. But John chapter 6 also includes the illustration and story of Jesus being the bread of life. It's interesting in the beginning of John chapter 6, Jesus multiplied what? The bread and fish. Yeah, the bread and fish. And then he concludes in John chapter 6, he concludes by three times talking about him being the bread of life. Now thousands of people were following Jesus for all the signs and wonders that he was doing. They saw their neighbors healed. They saw that he would provide food for 20,000 people. They wanted to hail him as king and ruler right then and there. His time was not come. But he told them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread from heaven. Moses, in verse 32, uh, pardon me, in verse 30, he said, So they said to him, What then do you do for us for a sign, so that we may see and believe on you? What sign and what proof, Jesus, will you provide us? How is it I should believe, I should believe something and see a sign, and then have faith. And Jesus said, "What work?" Uh, they asked, "What do you, work do you perform?" Our fathers ate of manna in the wilderness, as it was written. He gave them bread out of heaven. Then Jesus said to them, "Truly, truly, I say unto you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life." to the world. They were looking for a physical bread, and Jesus said, I am the bread of heaven. I am God. I am God incarnate. And the Jews at that time said, wait a minute, how can we believe that this Jesus is Lord? And he draws them back to the story found in Exodus. We'll not look verse by verse. I would challenge you to read John chapter 6 and Exodus chapter 16 and set them side by side because Jesus is appealing to the Old Testament truth as the children of Israel came out of Egypt. They came out in a hurry. It's estimated to feed that crowd uh, just the logistics of feeding the millions that came out of, out of Egypt. It would take 12 million pounds of food every few days. Did you catch that? 12 million pounds of food. They weren't out there long. They had packed up 
uh, as the children of Israel left Egypt, they had packed up their stuff. They had food for a few days. And pretty soon in Exodus chapter 16, you can read the story in detail. It says there was grumblings. Grumblings among God's people. Moses, why did you lead us out? We're going to die in the wilderness. Let us have the flesh pots of Egypt. Let's turn around and go home. And God heard their prayers in heaven. And he said, you will have sufficient. I will provide manna for you. Six days, I'll give you manna. None will fall the seventh day. You're to eat of the manna and that which I provide for you. Straight from heaven. On the sixth day, you would have a double portion. You won't need to gather anything on the Sabbath. You'll have it all. God's an amazing God, isn't he? He says, I'm going to give you everything you need. And I'm going to give you that space in Sabbath to realize I provided on the day of preparation for your Sabbath that all you need to do is rest and worship me. Now, first day, desire of ages, you can read it for yourself, describes it. There was a frost that fell across the land. It looked like frost. Now, we don't get much frost here. On a rare occasion, a couple times a year, maybe. But this was a frost that was a thick frost. They woke up. Ah. What's this? As far as the eye could see, the sun just glistened on the frost. They scraped the frost back. What's this? Kind of a dusting on the ground. They put some of it in their hand. They put it to their mouth. It was sweet to the taste. Bible says, and they all ate as according as they needed, gathering up each day enough. And for those who would try to gather up and hoard it, the worms came. Now, wait a minute. This is good stuff. I'm just going to pack a little extra in the back of my tent for day three and four. Uh-uh. Worms and things in, in your tent. But the next day, the same thing. Bible says it went on for how long? You remember the story, Exodus chapter 16? One week, two weeks, a year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. 40 years. Now, somewhere along year 10, you'd be wondering, is it still going to, going to continue? I did a quick math as I was listening to one of the songs, I've eaten 22,750 meals in my life. I believe the next one's pretty secure. You probably do also. But I don't get up in the morning and have to take the dust, uh, the frost off the ground and pick up the manna. And after 40 years of eating the same thing, they started grumbling and mur murmuring again. How can this be? We've eaten this food for 40 years. Now, I'm from, I'm from a place called Minnesota. If it's meat and potatoes and it has butter and gravy in it, I'm good for 40 years. I don't need a lot of extra. But since I've come out here, meat and potatoes might be uh, surpassed and replaced with tacos and burritos. Or Asian food. I, you know, I can eat just about any food. I love it. I like to eat. Forty years with the same thing. And they were grumbling and complaining. Oh, how short-sighted we are. How short-sighted we are when we think about supplying, uh, receiving that which is God has given us in our need in our life. Jesus is the bread of life, which will fill the hunger of your soul. Forty years in the wilderness, daily bread, and a double portion on the Sabbath. God provides, and it doesn't get any better than that. So I ask you, where's your belief system today? Is it in the belief that you work harder? You work harder 
and things will be better? Or are you on that squirrel cage of trying to work harder in your own might, only to find that you're exhausted? Belief must give way to trust. For you see, God is trustworthy and worthy of your trust. So I ask you the question again today, a question of reflection. When will you believe and when will you fully trust? Let us pray. Father, we've come to worship you. You've recorded on the pages of your sacred scripture today the lessons that are so easily read and at times so difficult to apply. We believe, Father, we believe deeply in Jesus. We trust, Father, but in the storms of life, Father, we look out, and at times we see only darkness. At times we don't see Jesus face to face. It's at that time, Father, that we ask that you would bolster our faith, our belief, Father, that we might place our trust in you, for you are trustworthy, that you will honor our faith. And as we bring our lives to you, Father, that you will bless that which we return to you, that it might not be added to, but that it might be multiplied, that others might share in the blessings that we have received. For those here this morning, Father, who wrestle with their faith and their belief because of complexities in their life, Father, give them the faith that they seek. For those who wrestle with issues of trust, not sure how much is my part and your part, O oh God, be faithful to them. Show them that you are trustworthy and can be trusted. Father, we long not for a sign, but we long that you would live in our hearts, that you would be the bread of life to us today. Bless us, Father, we ask in Christ's precious name. Amen.